and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most d and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from the venerable house of Doc. Great creator of Fractured Kingdom and prev and prevalent to tonight, Meta Meta Humans Rising, the what the one and only T Dave Silva. How you doing today, man, or tonight? Uh, day night. It's still light outside, so I'm gonna call it today. That's fine. <laughs> uh, I'm doing all right. <laughs> I'm I'm uh, I'm in the middle of a three day weekend, and uh, the kid is uh, done with school as of Tuesday, so you know. Good times. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings, as 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 it were. With that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role playing games, and what was it that made it stick? Oh, um, my introduction to role playing games. Uh, so I'm going to date myself here, all right? Um, what has become known as, uh, I guess, it's Basimi, if you want to actually try and pronounce it, or, or BX. I, I, always call, I always call it Beckme. Beckme? Sure, that works. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I only type it out. I never actually try to say it. Beckme, that works. Mm -hmm. um, the summer after the Red Box was released... My my next door neighbor co-opted me into a a game of D and D. Uh, he ran me through the the solo dungeon that's supposed to teach you the rules, mm -hmm. and then we tried playing through the the second like dungeon that they supplied there. Um, I think my character died I don't know a dozen times, and we would just play through the first two dungeons over and over again. Because we didn't know what it was. We thought it was more like a board game. And we didn't even get into the concept of making characters uh, that first summer. Uh, so that, that was my introduction to D&D. &D, was, was watching Bargle kill a cleric uh, on loop. Mm -hmm. um, which sadly, I don't remember the name of the cleric, but I do remember the name of the magic user. <laughs> well, of course, because um, magic users have to be the center of attention all the damn time. Well, you know, Bargle's got a kind of cool vibe to it. So um, there, there's my my humble beginning there. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I didn't play a lot of D&D &D the next year, but I did enjoy reading the modules, and there were many. <laughs> um, and then came, like, Game Changer, Mm -hmm. uh, another game from TSR uh, called uh, Marvel Superheroes. Um, um, I believe that I'm yeah. given the time. Given the timing, I'm guessing that would be Marvel Phase Rip. Yeah, I was gonna say, which is, is probably better known as the Phase Rip uh, engine, right? I I just ca I just called that because there's multiple games that have taken the name Marvel Superheroes, so I use that for sanity's sake. Yeah, you are you are one hundred percent correct because there, there's not a, a new name to it. Uh, it's just Marvel Superheroes, and it's a role playing game. Mm -hmm. But this this is the one where um, you had the phase rip uh, attribute block, mm -hmm. and uh, that was just a blast to play. Um, I mean, we we played that game all the way through high school, even though. Uh, support for it had long dried up. And there was just something about, hey, how many D10s do you have? Let's roll them all and figure out what kind of wacky characters pop out of this thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but yeah, uh, eventually I found like a stable gaming group. Um, so I, just to kind of uh, tell you a little about myself, um, I spent the summers with my grandmother uh, and the school years with my uh, my family in, in New York, 
So I was bumping between two different states. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, in the early 90s, I, I moved to the third state. Um, but eventually, I did find a regular gaming group. <laughs> uh, and so uh, that was like the era of second edition D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. um, and then we, we, we jumped on like first edition Shadowrun. We jumped on like... Uh, early edition vampire. I, I don't remember if it was first edition vampire or second edition vampire, but we jumped on there as soon as we saw it. Um, we played a, a fair amount of Palladium, or, or we tried to play a fair amount of Palladium. Uh, that was more conceptual than, than uh, actual getting to play stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then um, after, after high school, uh, moved again uh, back to the other side of the country. Uh, and uh, that was a whole lot of World of Darkness stuff because now we're into like the, the late 90s and kind of like the rise of White Wolf. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was in Atlanta, so that didn't, that didn't hurt much, right? <laughs> uh, but that, that's, that's kind of like my gaming. Uh, uh, I should say there was a, a fair amount of like West End games, Star Wars D6 mm -hmm. and Cyberpunk along the way. Um, Huge fan of, of uh, that D6 engine and then the Cyberpunk game uh, as a whole. Mm -hmm. Now, given all, given all, that's quite a that's quite a lot of jumping about, which is all which it's always interesting seeing the differences between those who are mostly one system lifers and those who and those who jumped about. Not that either one is better than the other, but it's interesting. See, it's interesting seeing that um, chain, but. What pro what prompted the what prompted you to um start to start development on metahumans? Um. Okay. So 2013, we released Fractured Kingdom. Uh, I, <clears throat> I I should jump back a little bit before mm -hmm. then. Uh. So before Fractured Kingdom, I was, I was working on a, on a different game, which was like a post apocalypse fantasy setting. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was just a game that I couldn't get right. And I, I couldn't make it work. And so I, I uh, threw everything in the air and like blew it all up and just said, okay, I'm going to start with an engine that I think is uh, what I want to see in game. Um, and as it was taking shape, I had this kind of like romance period China thing in my head. Um, but... I accept the fact that I don't know enough about that period of time to do that right. And so that kind of became Fractured Kingdom. Um, and then there was this period afterwards where I'm looking at Fractured Kingdom and saying, okay, um, what does this do well? What other kind of stories can I tell with it? Um and so probably around uh, two years afterwards, I started working on MetaHumans Rising, mm -hmm. uh, just taking that core open action system, stripping away um, the constructs of the Fractured Kingdom setting and, and um, reimagining it as like um, a more flexible superhero setting. So that that's how that got started. Yep. Um, what I want to do is I, I wanted to be able to explore the idea of everything can matter when it makes narrative sense. All right, I get, I got you. And um, one when it comes now when it comes to the when it comes to the superhero end of things, um, what was your what was what got you into were you were you a big were you a big um, comic reader growing up, or was was it something that or was it something that you um, got into because you were volunteer were volunteered at one point, or did you get in through um, the non comic media end of it? Oh no, uh, I was a comic guy growing up. Um, I uh, I started with um, like X Men and Defenders. Um, which I think my, my, my Defenders team is like Doctor Strange, Silver Surfer, and the Hulk, and then, you know, cue in whoever you need. 
uh, like that time period, and there's like the Chris Claremont era of the X Men. It's kind of where I got my start. Um, Golden Age. Uh, well, um, late bronze. I think. If well, you get I don't. About I don't mean Golden Age in terms of in terms of comic in terms of comic history era, but the Cla but the Claremont run is considered the is considered the definitive period when it comes to the X Men. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yes, yes. Um, I think around that. I th unless I'm mistaken, around that time, that was when um, the Weapon X story was done, and that's considered th that's considered one of the definitive um, stories. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, so yeah, it was around that, well, that would be a little bit after I got into comic books. I was, that was like a few years after I started reading them. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, uh, again, today myself, I really enjoyed Marvel's New Universe, if you remember that. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I, um, wait, Mar Marvel, you, which Marvel Universe are you, t are you talking about? Are you, are you referring to the, um, because there was an RPG with that name that's kind of become the, Redheaded stepchild of um, Marvel RPGs. So uh, I think it was either 1985 or 1987. Yeah, 1985. Mm -hmm. uh, Marvel came out with a, a imprint called New Universe, which was completely separate from 616, mm -hmm. and it started off as. Um, Everything was a normal world, right? And an event happened, and it changes everything. Sort sort of Marvel's uh, answer to to um, Earth Prime. Well, it, it, it was more like uh, Marvel made the TV show Heroes mm -hmm. twenty five years before Heroes, <laughs> right? All or right. Uh, fifteen years before Heroes, twenty years before Heroes, because it, it wasn't necessarily superheroes it was people with powers and and coping with that all right um and just because you had abilities didn't necessarily mean they were were good it it, it might have actually been marvel's attempt to emulate like um george r, r. martin's uh, wild card series if you're familiar with that yeah um, uh oh that's an anthology series I, he's just like the editor and uh I, I say his name because like everyone knows his name now. <laughs> yeah, I just I just call, um, and I'm pr I'm pretty sure by the time I'm pretty sure by the time by the by the time by the time I fin by the time I finish this interview, um, Winds of Winter will still will still not release. So you can put that under the list of things that were finished before Winds of Winter. <laughs> <laughs> um, excuse me, I'm sorry about that, but. Yeah, it's just, it's just when you when you meant when you mentioned when you mentioned the whole universe thing, I immediately thought I I immediately got thrown off on that. But it de it definitely sounds like you were more of a Marvel guy than a DC guy. Is that accurate? Uh, for the most part, um, like I I dabbled in DC, but the the characters didn't really grab me the way the Marvel characters did mm -hmm. uh, until Vertigo, right? <laughs> Which <laughs> like, argu uh, arguably Vertigo. Kinda doesn't count. <laughs> um. So John Constantine, definitively my like DC character, mm -hmm. right? I.e. the excuse but, for Alan Moore to draw Sting. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, but to be clear, I don't think they should have ever tried to reintroduce the character back to the DC universe after no. they like really split him off. Right. He, he doesn't. He doesn't belong there. No, the, the whole Sorry. point. The whole point of the whole point of Vertigo was to try and t was to try and tell these sto these stories under DC's umbrella, but c but wouldn't fit within the DC universe. Right. Like early early issues make reference to like the larger DC universe, um, but it's either after like his thirty fifth or fortieth birthday, they're just like no. No, we can't. We can't do this anymore. We can't have a character that ages in time in the land of DC. <laughs> yeah, because bringing bringing in Constantine, bring. I think the. I'd say the. I'd, I'm trying to remember if if Swamp Thing start started out in ver, start, start started out in Vertigo. If that was D, if that was DC proper, but characters like Constantine, characters like like the entirety of the Sandman mythos. <laughs> 
try yeah. you try and put you try and put that into the DC universe, and you have so, you have so many problems that your desk is going to be buried in them. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I I'll say this like you know I I could live with like a a subsection where it's like. Any character that's in Sandman regularly, like those, those can all exist in that same kind of like subsection, mm. right? <laughs> uh, but that that was my dip into DC. Yeah, and for obvious, obviously for for a lot for a lot of people, their their major dip was um was th- was through the animated series more than more than it, oh. for both. Actually, I'd would say for a whole generation of comic readers, they they got into comics through through the um, car, through the animated versions from Marvel and DC in the uh, '90s. Which one which one is better or which one is worse is um, a matter of interpretation, but but it happened. Um, yeah, uh, you're 100 percent right. Um, and I'll tell you this: I, I love the DCAU, right? The DC animated universe from the the late nineties and into the two thousands. Yeah. Uh, my kid is like six now, and I'm showing him the Justice League, mm-hmm. and like that's like our our thing. Uh, and that's that's probably the the closest I get to like um, DC universe proper is like the DCAU. Like I I think I picked up the movies that have extended it. Um, I, I did not to get down that tangent, but yeah, there's been a couple of movies that are set in the DCAU that take place or that have come out in the last couple of years. I picked those up, mm-hmm. uh, and I, I have thoroughly enjoyed those. So, <laughs> yeah. Now, did you did you ever di- did you ever dip into Im- into Image when they, when they were making waves around that time? Um, so I picked up a lot of like ones and twos um like i i had like spawn one through four or five and i had uh the first issue or the first issue of young blood and decided that was not for me um <laughs> i don't think young blood was for anybody but but liefeld <laughs> probably uh, um uh, i'm trying to think were there any others like i, I didn't want really to get into gen 13 or um, some of the other titles that they had, and that, like once you start getting into the '90s, is actually kind of my my uh, when I'm moving away from print comic books, uh, just because of like other things that were going on in my life. All right, I got you. Um, now when it came to when it, when it came to met when it came to um meta meta humans, um. First off, I, with with some of the stuff I can, with some of the stuff that I've seen with it, I definitely get more of a Marvel, a more of a um, old school Marvel vibe than than anything else. But one thing that one thing that real that really stood that really stood out to me, and some and something that you made special mention to to br- to bring to to bring to my attention before we even did this interview, was the um, was the fu- was the um, fighting style subsystem. The only oh. other, the only other, the only other, su- the only other supers or universal game that I can think of that's done something remotely, si- remotely similar to, to putting that level of detail into it, was um, Champions slash Hero, the uh, the iceberg of all to and the second biggest iceberg in um in universal style gaming in my in my opinion, um. With all the jumping about that you did over the years, was um was champions ever something that you dipped into? Um, so I I played a, a bit of like champions third edition, um, like right around the time they started doing things like cyber hero and fantasy hero. Yeah. Um, was the time I was getting into champions. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I played a little bit of fifth edition. Uh, when that came out, um, that, uh, I'm get I, th- I'm guessing since you mentioned fifth edition, I'm guessing you're referring to when ch- when um cha- when instead of it being champions, it just got integrated into hero system being the forefront hero. and champions being a setting of hero system. Yes. Yes. Um. And uh, give. 
now given that given that given that 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 brings me to that brings me to one issue that's kind of the elephant in the room whenever you're discussing either universal or superhero games because the two of the two of them are are separated by a razor thin wire is the issue of choice paralysis because with both because of the fact that you've got that you've got a whole host of options to de to deal with um it's there's the possibility of, of someone getting o of someone getting overwhelmed by ch by choice in terms of what they in terms of what they want to build did is that some is that something that you ever encountered with your experiences with superhero games and if so how did you try and mitigate that with metahumans okay so I'm I'm gonna start this by saying, um, I don't want to speak badly of other game systems, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm going to focus on uh, what we did to avoid analysis paralysis. All right. Um, and, and to provide that like flexibility. Mm -hmm. uh, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, so. What we wanted to do was make sure that the content was digestible, right? Mm -hmm. So the way you you build a power um, is you, you're not building a power for each effect that the hero can do, but rather you're building the concept of the hero, right? Um, and uh, I, I I like to use the Human Torch for this. Uh, uh, again, you know, being more of a Marvel guy, as you pointed out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so the Human Torch, uh, his body becomes fire. It lets him fly, and he can shoot bolts of fire, mm -hmm. right? Now, he can do some other really cool stuff on top of that, but, like, you boil it down, and those are, like, kind of the core elements of his character, right? Or of, of his power, of his character, right? So when you build your power... Right, I'm only going to build this one power. I might call it Flame On. Mm -hmm. Right, pick the elements that fit. Right, so I have a body of fire. Uh, I'm going to make it painful for you to hit me. Um, I'm going to pick uh, ranged attacks uh, that are devastating because they're fire bolts, and I'm going to pick the ability to fly. Right, and we use kind of like key words. Um, that lets you easily or hopefully easily identify this is like the, the, the scope of what this is going to add to your overall power, right? Now, there's a lot of, or no, there's a fair amount of like detail that I'm glossing over, but at a broad level, that's what it comes down to, right? And what you build in that, like what's on the page is just the jumping off point for what your character can do, right? So to go back to Johnny Storm, like he can create cages of fire, or he can go like Nova, um, uh, all these other like little tricks that he pulls off, right? And that's where we have a willpower mechanic that says, well, it's not on the page, but you can push yourself to do more, right? As long as it fits thematically or fits conceptually, right? I want the narrative around it, and we're gonna make it work. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, does that does that answer the question, or, yeah. or was there now? I'd and to be to be fair, when I say, when I say that when I say that choice paralysis is an is an issue with superhero and universal games, I'm not um I'm not throwing anyone under the bus for that. It's just one it's just one of those things that inevitably is going to happen. The more options you pro you provide to players and GMs. Yeah, I just, I just didn't want to be like, well, this game does X and I do Y, that sort of thing. That's why I just, yeah. not, just to give you perspective. Um, I want to shift. I want to shift over to the to the whole the whole fighting style system that you um, that you can that you conceived with metahumans because, as I mentioned before, this is something that ri that's rarely co that's rarely covered, um, in a lot of, in a lot of role playing games as a whole. They they tend to have a very gloss over attitude when it comes to um fighting style now even um when i when i not too long ago when i re when i revisited doing a campaign with star with um start with star with with um star wars d6 one of the first house rules that i put in was to try and put in some system to 
um, reflect the um, forms of lightsaber combat. Um, it's funny you should say that. For uh, for May the 4th this year, we actually did uh, a series of articles on uh, how to make a lightsaber in Metahumans Rising, and then like if you have Jedi or Sith training. Yeah. But what pro- what prompted... What prompted the idea of of dedicating a significant amount of the book to coming up with coming up with a fighting style system? So, all right, um, I, I want to differentiate one thing. So, um, each week we post new content on the House Doc website, mm-hmm. and I did a series of articles on real world martial arts, right? Uh, and that just it built off of what's in the core book. Right now, what's in the core book, though, um, we have a basic framework for how combat works. Mm-hmm. Right, um, you know how to make an attack, how to defend, um, how you your your action economy, um, and the, the, those types of mechanics. Um, but on top of that, we wanted to include comic book style um, maneuvers. Right. And so we have optional combat maneuvers that anyone can do where you just kind of like you're trading accuracy or, or something else mm-hmm. for this added effect, right? Like if you want to try to trip somebody or you want to do like a, a powerful blow, that sort of thing, it's all in there, right? Um, and so the game also allows you to specialize in points of interest uh and this this is where that combat diversity really comes in is when you say okay i have the ability to pick multiple combat maneuvers and specialize in them right so you don't have to do this it just focuses your character down that path right and so you can play a, a very generalized, like I put everything into my powers, um, but I don't really have a focus when it comes to if we get into a strap versus um, when we get into a fight, I have a very unique fighting style. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And these are the things that I'm best at. Mm-hmm. Right. Um. And the reason why we do that is, one, because uh, we think that, uh, or, or we want to make sure that we can represent the different flavors of um, comic books mm. and comic book characters, right? And, and two, because it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> like, way, um, too, way too many people under, underestimate the value of rule of cool. I will be flat out on that. Um, or or they'll go or they'll go with the or they'll go with some sort of realism argument until I have to sh- until I have to shoot it down because um let's let's not for, let's not forget um there there is an age there's an age old strategy something that looks dangerous probably is dangerous even if it actually isn't we see so we see, go uh, ahead sorry. We see we see that we see this in we see this in classical and mod, and modern armies. We see this in um, we see this in wildlife. Why do, why do you think so many poisonous animals um, have very bright colors? Uh, my wife and I were actually talking about that earlier today uh, when looking at some lizards. Mm-hmm. But we um. Uh, it's funny that you should mention like what's realistic versus what's fun. Mm-hmm. Um, we try to. I uh, not to get into like like uh, the, the GSN theory stuff. G- but GNS. GNS. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Um, not yeah. Not to get too too far into like the that that kind of thing, but we were definitely focused on like accessibility of play. Mm-hmm. And does it feel right for the 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 game that we're creating? Right? Um, is it realistic? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that's more a matter of narrative. 
um, because we we put in an added layer of danger when you try a maneuver because they're just more difficult, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the I think one of the big differences though, like to difference between like martial arts and superpowers, like a combat maneuver can be attempted. Like if you want to knock somebody down with your energy blast, you go for it. It doesn't have to be like a a, a spinning leg sweep or something like that, right? Yeah. Uh, just describe what you're doing, and the rules are there to facilitate that. Mm -hmm. Pers um, Personally, I've I've always advocated for focusing more on believability over realism. Yeah. Uh, so there's an interesting distinction there. Like we want to have a a cohesive world, right? Like mm -hmm. it, it it flows together. It's not necessarily realistic. I mean, we're talking about like superheroes, mm -hmm. right? Um, but uh, if you look at the sample characters, we have giant living volcano monster guy and guy with arrow, and they exist side by side uh, on the same team and are, are equally competent, right? Um, they're just competent in, in different ways. Yeah. That does bring me to some. That does bring me to something else that's been a been a bit been a bit of a um a issue that that I've seen that I've seen get I've seen get brought up in discourse on superhero games, and that is, um, having having two having two people of di having two people of um of di of different setups, but still but still but st but still being relatively equal and. Just to just to just to utilize one a Marvel example and two an example of this sort of complete opposites approach, um, I'll use the Hulk and Spider-Man in this case. Um, one one of them one of them essentially the the picture example of a strength build versus a dex build, <laughs> as the as the meme goes, and. Narratively, they're narratively they're supposed to be they're supposed to be on relatively equal footing, being city being city level heroes. Um, but in in practice, with some RPGs, one of them ends up out ends up outclassing the other. Um, has the, ha, during playtesting have you have you had any instances of that, where 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 um, some where some where some builds ended up um. Out and up, out and up, out, cla out outclassing another, even though they're in the same relative tier, or did that not really happen? Um, so the game actually bakes in uh, preventative measures. <laughs> uh, like the the core engine um, is designed to let you have a level playing field. Mm -hmm. um, so when you build your power, you're going to decide your parent attribute for it, right? And this is like your attribute power pairing mm -hmm. for when you make. Uh, roles with your abilities. Okay, so Spider-Man would probably pick Dexterity uh, to go with his, you know, spider body. Okay, uh, whereas the Hulk is probably going to pick either his strength or his constitution. Uh, you know, probably his strength though <laughs> uh, to go with his 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 power, right? His his gamma irradiated body power or whatever you want to call that. Mm -hmm. uh, um. And so, while the Hulk can, you know, punch through uh, the the unobtainium wall, uh, uh, I'm blanking on vibranium, uh, not vibranium, uh, adamantium. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, Spider-Man will sense it coming and try and get out of the way. Yeah. Right. Um, and then if we're like. In a, in a narrative situation, and we're rolling dice around this, it's not necessarily that the Hulk punches Spider-Man and that's how the fight ends, right? Uh, it's, it's how the interaction might happen, right? The, the Hulk, you know, the Spider-Man might avoid the blow and the Hulk hits the ground, uh, and it sends, like, waves of, um, you know, Earth up in the air, and that's what actually hits him, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because on paper he's just too agile to ever, or the Hulk to ever lay hands on him. But narratively, like we interact with the environment, right? Mm -hmm. Why can't we just make that part of our narrative in our game? 
right? Mm-hmm. So again, this comes back to what makes a cohesive sense in, in the shared narrative, right? The mechanics are going to allow these two to be on par with each other. Um, now, if you want to take a a pairing where they're not necessarily as balanced, like say um, uh, Batman and Robin, mm-hmm. we we have um, some rules in there for that scenario. Uh, actually, um, our signature team is made up of. Um, so let me take some back. Character. Character creation, one of the things you decide is like the scope and power level of your characters. Okay. Are you like original X-Men where you're basically normal humans, but you have some special abilities? Are you more like uh, Spider-Man where uh, you're, you're just, you know, for the most part, better than an average person and you have powers on top of that? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, or is it like... Uh, you're at this tier where um, it is hard to for you to even associate with normal people because your powers have put you outside of that scope, right? And and there, we have degrees of that mm-hmm. uh, in the in the rules, and you can make characters from different power levels and have them in the same game together. Um, I mentioned willpower before, and so. Um, willpower allows you to do these exceptional things to go beyond your limits. And when you're playing in a mixed power level game like that, the lower powered hero gets more willpower to offset that. Right? Um, So Batman and Robin or Batman and Superman. Right? Um, They can be built on different tiers and we can actually just say, no, they're, they're not equal. Right? But they are very viable in the same game together. Um, one of the things that we try to allow for is also like a rotating roster, which is why we built a team of eight heroes with only four players. Um, and it's just a, a question of, you know, who's in the super team and who do we want to play today? Um, you know, that's going to be featured in this next story. Mm-hmm. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. Now, with the, with that kind of thing with that kind of thing in mind, one there's one particular um, one particular type of of power set that I've seen some that I've seen some games um, struggle with, and give, given some of the people in my audience is one of those things I'd inevitably get get asked with with something like this, and that is the that is the transforming hero um, motif because. A lot of the, a lot of the people who f- who follow my stuff are big are big um, are big fans of Tokusatsu series, whether that be whether that be Super Sentai or Power Rangers in in the states or um, Kamen Rider or or um, Ultraman. Um, so, given now with with some with some games like with some games, it trying to do the whole the whole alternate form is always is a bit crunchy, but with um with and i'm not i'm not trying to throw anyone under the bus with this but with metahumans how how would how would you how would you interpret the that particular um motif okay so before i i jump into like your your um your tokokatsu heroes or your common writer Mm -hmm. style characters or your power ranger style characters Mm -hmm. um let me talk about bruce banner (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um so so one of the options that you have mm-hmm. um is, is uh there's like you can say like an alternate form mm-hmm. okay and you can have a a mundane identity that is separate than your super identity um and the game has like full character sheets for our heroes and our super villains but we also introduce the idea of background characters so um, if you're playing like a more sandbox game, you can spin up an encounter in just a few minutes using background characters. Mm-hmm. And we leverage that for the heroes as well. So if you wanted to have like an ally or a vehicle, uh, or you wanted to be like, 
I can summon a, a host of uh, demons. Mm -hmm. Those are all background characters that we're going to build, uh, and it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty, it's really quick to put together, mm -hmm. right? So for Bruce Banner, Bruce Banner is one of these background characters. It has uh, a much smaller contained stat block, um, and it doesn't take away from who the Hulk is. Uh, it's just a thing that exists on the side. Okay, um, and they they swap between the two. Mm -hmm. um, alternatively, you have characters like um, Iron Man, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, let, let's let's differentiate between like say Iron Man in the first movie and Iron Man in the second movie. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, if you say that Iron Man has to put on his suit, um, you would take a limitation that like everything is tied to this piece of gear, right? Um, and it's just to what severity does it take for you to to um, put the suit on? And you can you can have varying degrees of. This takes an entire scene and it looks really awesome to, I put my hands in the suitcase and now I'm ready to rock and roll. Incidentally, um, I love that they, I love that they managed to make the suitcase thing work that was a, that was treated like a joke in the cartoon. I, I do believe that was actually a request from Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> uh, and I, I absolutely loved it. I, 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 uh, I do think Iron Man 2 is my favorite Iron Man movie because it is quintessential everything is his fault mm -hmm. um but not to get off on a tangent now let's, yep. let's address um your uh your 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 um your common writer type characters and mm -hmm. that's gonna follow that same style right how long does that transformation sequence happen right and the other question that you're gonna ask is when they are not transformed, do they have a portion of their power or no? Um, right. For for the purposes, all... for the purposes of this, I will use um, I will use um, the setup with a lot of with a lot of the Kamen Rider entries during the Showa era. So, um, so not so mid set mid seventy so um seventy seventy one all the way through eighty seven. Um, for a lot of those characters, they were um. They were cyborgs, and the the approach is that they they had a they had a lesser amount of of their of their regular powers. It's just that a lot. It's just that a good amount of it was was um, diverted to to helping main, to helping maintain a a human appearance. Um, yeah. Um. So without getting too deep into the mechanics, like it, it's. I would build that as a regular power, mm -hmm. and then I would gate like my higher tier abilities, like my show stopping abilities, mm -hmm. to activating my armor, which is my transformation sequence. Mm -hmm. Right. Once I do that, then I can have all this host of other things. But I have a, a suite of abilities. Like I may be, you know, like faster, tougher, stronger, mm -hmm. uh, even while I'm just looking like a regular human. But once I transform. You know, now I'm punching through walls and, and doing all sorts of crazy stuff. Yeah. Now, mm. I'd like to, I'd like to throw a further monkey wrench in this by br by bringing up um, Ultraman, which okay, it, which now uh, first off there there's there's two um there's two ma there's two major caveats with with ha with handling this. One is the, is the fact that um every every hero in the in the Ultra series has has needed. Has needed some sort of um, human host in order to in order to manifest, in order to be, in order to be their full size, but two but two, they can only because of because of the uh, it's because of either the pollution in the earth or for other reasons, a um a ultra can only maintain that transformation for three minutes. Okay, so um. I, I, uh, I I'm going to take a moment to just say if you guys haven't if you haven't seen it yet, you go to the House Doc website. We actually have an AP, mm -hmm. uh, and if you check out the Out of Time uh, actual plays, 
I, I think it's on like Stitcher and like Apple, uh, the, the other podcast players too. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it's called Open Actions. Was the the podcast? We don't do it anymore, but it, it used to be a thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but check out the Out of Time story arc. One of the characters is named Crustacean Rex, and um, he goes from being like regular sized to being super sized, mm-hmm. right? Um, like he is. Uh, I, I think they're 60 feet tall. It's been years since we got to play with Crustacean Rex. Mm-hmm. Um, but he is a giant monster when he assumes his full form. Um, and then in our Three Years Academy, we had another character named Brorilla who had his Aperon form, which is another, like, I get huge kind of character. Mm-hmm. Right? And the way we've done that in the past is uh, I mentioned specialties earlier. Mm-hmm. Right, uh, taking a specialty within my power to represent becoming a giant, right? And so that that helps me with my offense, but then I'll also take a um, a limitation that says I'm easier to hit in my giant size, right? We we don't have to get into a lot of details um, because my extra accuracy when it comes to offense can be traded for damage, yep. right? Um, and this goes back to those combat maneuvers we were talking about earlier. So I can I can define being big as I'm now really good at hitting you or I hit harder. Both work just fine with the narrative by just the fact that I have a specialty for it. And the limitation covers the fact that I'm easier to hit. All right. And I was mentioning uh, gating other abilities. Um, we have uh, aspects of powers um, like impervious, which is I just negate damage for a turn. Mm-hmm. Right, and, and if you wanted to, you could gate that to your giant size. Um, now, for the question of how would I do the three minutes thing, um, there's a couple of ways because time is abstracted in Metahumans Rising, mm-hmm. right? Um, like, uh, I, I think at one point we actually describe uh, taking your turn as being. Uh, one to two panels per action that you take. Um, but a, a, a scene takes the time that it takes based on the narrative that you guys are creating. Uh, we, we also abstract like, distances and things like that. Um, so setting like a hard three minutes gets kind of fuzzy, but you can do things... Um, there are limitations that would say, okay... If I if I roll two ones on a, a roll, um, I've run out of this ability, right? And I can apply that to being giant sized, right? Um, alternatively, I could like set own, my own limitations, however I wanted to find it. Like I can only do this for three turns. I can only do this for, um, you know, I have to spend a willpower if I want to maintain it. Mm-hmm. Right, um, and I would just define that however I wanted to, based on the kind of narrative. And if I was going for a time thing, um, I, I would probably say, well, I can only I can only maintain this form for in number of turns that we agree on as a group is fair. Um, and if things aren't resolved by that point, I either need to spend a willpower to maintain this form for an action. Or uh, I have to drop that specialty. Now I think if I remember Ultraman correctly, like he just dies. Like if he if he goes longer than three minutes, he dies. Uh, and I, I don't know if there's any exceptions for that. There, um, it's uh, because of because of how because of how long and how and how many different ha- how many different hands have passed the Ultra series o- over the years. Let's let's go let's go with the notion that that's not. That um that that could, that that's a can go either way, but something happens if you go if he tries to go over three minutes. Yeah. So um, I I would either say like I have to drop it, or I take um, damage, and th- there's some guidance in the book for this. Like I I would take in amount of damage, or I have to spend a willpower to maintain that form. Right. So let's either drop it take harm or or maintain or, or, or spend a resource to continue doing this thing. Like it, it it's a hundred percent doable. Right? Um yeah. 
now the last the the last um, entry when it comes to Togusats that I wanted to pick your brain on in regards and how do you, how you do it mechanically is in regard to Super Sentai. And give, given the fact that with a lot of the setups in that involves a lot of t a lot of teams, a lot of t and a lot of team based attacks and maneuvers, how would how would you accommodate that in the in the metahumans um, system? Okay, so do we want to talk about giant mechs first, or do we want to talk about teaming up? Um, the me the mechs thing, I f the mechs thing, I feel I feel like I feel like that would I feel like that would be relatively easier. I want to talk about the t about the team about the teaming up part first. Okay, perfect. Okay, so teaming up is super simple in Meta Humans Rising, right? If you have an action available and your teammate is doing something. Mm -hmm. Right, and you want to support them, describe how you're supporting them and what characteristic that you're going to use to support them in their action. Right? And then they get to add that to their role. Okay. So the bonus is based on your competencies, right? You you spend an action, you hand that off to the other player. Okay. The, the player who's taking the action then makes the role. It's only one role to resolve whatever that may be. Um, if you have, let's say, five heroes, each one's in a different colored uniform, and you're all going to team up to do something at the same time, mm -hmm. you can do that. It's the same thing, right? Uh, and I mentioned this earlier, you can trade like accuracy for damage. So... If five people say, we're going to team up to do this special attack on the boss, right? Okay, I'm going to give the, like, leader character or the character who's going to finish the, the, the final maneuver, like the, the signature mover after the cutscene, um, the bonus, however that works out. And then they'll trade whatever that accuracy is for added damage or... Um, if, if that's, that's not what you're doing. Um, but this is also true for... Um, I'm trying to sneak into a place, right? Mm -hmm. My character's not stealthy, but the other person I'm traveling with is. They can help me. Right? It's the same system. All right, I got... Um, I... Go ahead. I got, I got, I got you. Now... Um, I, I, I want to give you just a, a fun... Um, Example in one of our one of our test games, we had a um, an arcane swordsman, mm -hmm. and we had a psychic. And as the characters developed, the psychic learned how to actually project. And so narratively, he would start inhabiting the swordsman's body and serving as like an extra set of eyes mm -hmm. to make him a better sword. Right, and that that used that same kind of team up mechanic. Which that that cer that certainly makes um that certainly makes sense. Um, now since since, you, <laughs> since you since you brought up the since you brought up the whole um the whole mech part of it, I th I think I would be I think I'd be remiss if I didn't address that part. So, um, there's a lot of heroes, uh, in comics that have. A ton of gadgets. Batman is infamous for this, mm -hmm. right? And we wanted to represent that. We use um, a boon called Tools, right? And these are just like I'm going to use this thing once a session. Um, and this might be a hidden weapon like a batarang or a bat shark repellent, <laughs> or it might be um, a grapnel that lets me uh, just instantly scale a building, mm -hmm. right? But it might also be the bat wing, right? Uh, so all you have to do is, when you purchase tools, select which tools that your character uses most frequently. One of them is a vehicle, right? Now, you get kind of some default stats for the vehicle that you can customize, and then you can invest more into that if you want to. Um, we actually played one game that was like um, set outer space, where one of our heroes found 
a damaged alien uh, mech, and it became his hobby to repair it. And uh, that his repairing it was him investing points into tools and into the vehicle selection of tools. Mm-hmm. So that when they faced off against an alien armada, he jumped in his mech and went out all Rick Hunter style. So, yep. things that we've done. <laughs> now, with now, um, with with all with all that in with all of that in with all that in mind, and th- thank you for in for indulging in, in indulging in this bit in that bit of insanity but um what do you what uh, aside from i know that you've been pu- you've been putting out up you've been putting out updates when it comes to um when it comes to metahumans fa- fairly regularly but um what as far as metahumans in general in in specifically and how and house of docket in general um, what do you have? What do you have in mind for what the for what the future is going to hold? Uh, well, it's funny you bring that up. So we're we're actually just hitting our two year anniversary, mm-hmm. and um, if you haven't seen it, if you go to the House Talk website, we also have a web comic, mm-hmm. right? I finished the first issue of it. Um, one of the things that uh, I committed to in 2020 was posting. Uh, one update every week mm-hmm. um, of some form of content. Um, and so each month we, we release an adventure seed. Excuse me for a second. Mm-hmm. Uh, each month we release a, a new adventure. Um, this year we, we've actually gotten into um stories that are interconnected right um so you can have um story arcs that that actually span multiple months of free content Mm -hmm. um and that's been really fun um we're also doing series on how to create different types of characters um so that martial arts series uh that i sent you yeah. Uh, actually, came out of that right now we're actually doing mutant animals. Um, I have not gotten to tease yet, in case you're wondering, but I did cover ninjutsu in the martial arts section. Mm-hmm. If you see where that's going. Uh, and uh, but we've, we've also done articles on like superhero day jobs or um, iconic uh, roles of heroes. Um. And uh, we, we just we plan on, on keeping that going. Um, during the pandemic, we also released uh, the Burning Earth Arena, which is our first other world supplement, mm-hmm. which is um, uh, it uses the Metahumans Rising rule set, but it is a, a post apocalypse universe where the people of Earth are beholden to uh, these uh, people living above them in uh, uh, satellite cities. Um, And the only form of entertainment is the arena, where uh, champions hunt down people who live outside of society for for entertainment purposes. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was just a... uh, What what do they call it? Um... COVID creativity. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, that, that's something, it was like a 60 page supplement. It, it's free on DriveThruRPG. Uh, or every, all of our PDFs are free. Uh, pay what you want on DriveThruRPG right now um, because of um, reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, uh, that was kind of our, our, our love letter to things like The Running Man. And the Hunger Games and Battle Angel, right? Um, and we've been looking at uh, other other ways to utilize this. Um, one thing that uh, we're, we're doing our we also started a Patreon last year. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, in addition to the weekly content we provide on the House Talk website, um, the Patreon provides additional bonus material. 
skills and it provides early access. Um, and as we hit uh, uh, different like tiers, we're going to be doing a, a full MetaHumans Rising uh, setting. Um, so the core book provides you the tools to uh, build your own world. Mm -hmm. um, and in the character creation process, we talk about the universe that our signature team lives in. And then in the GM chapter, we provide you some factions that fit into that larger universe. Um, and then uh, if we can build our Patreon, we'll be continuing to expand that into a, a much more diverse world, um, kind of a, a ready-made uh, place that you can take and make your own. Um, and all of the adventures that we've written so far, uh, there's over 20 at this point, mm. all kind of fit into this larger world that we're hoping to, to uh, be able to create through Patreon. All right, so that's one of our, our goals right now. Uh, and then, of course, um, as we hit tiers, we'll, we'll be doing more with the comic as well, uh, along with other like additional content, like new factions mm -hmm. and uh, and groups for uh, your campaign. Yeah, now I'll I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how that develops. And with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come on to come on to the show and. Enjoy the um, insanity at play here. And anytime, anytime, really you see, mm -hmm, and anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. I, I, uh, I support this. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>